Ophelia means daughter. We are the daughters of the women who came before us and we fight so that our daughters may be free. We are a women-led volunteer organization. Our vision is a world free from patriarchy where all women and girls are liberated. We seek to contribute to the women's liberation movement by building sisterhood and solidarity among women, locally, nationally, and globally. By amplifying the voices of women, particularly those less often heard or purposefully silenced, and by defending women's human rights. Dear visitors, thank you for coming today to the Philia webinar, Sex Trade Survivors Demanding the Global Change. I am Luba Fine from Philia. 13 survivors from 12 different countries are taking part in this webinar. The first speaker is Simon Watson from Australia. Simon is a survivor of legal and illegal prostitution, an activist and a former human rights delegate for Amnesty International. After exiting, Simone dedicated the rest of her life to edu educating the public about the harms of prostitution. She was one of the contributors to the book, Prostitution Narratives, Stories of the Survival of the Sex Trade, by Caroline Norma and the Melinda tankard -Rest. In her article, she explained the motivation behind her activism that costs her money and affects her health. Let me read a small part of it for you. This is my life. Would I do this if I thought prostitution was just another job I once had? If being prostituted was, the, was sex work? It costs money to travel, even when almost everything is paid for. Having done it at least nine times last year, I often risk losing my rent at home. The one of the few places I feel regularly safe because I chose to risk it. Sound familiar? Just for the opportunity that someone, anyone who has sway might listen, and I mean really listen, not listen and put it in the opinion basket. Not listen and say that full decriminalization is somehow bringing in us into the 21st century, which is the most oppressive form of, of sexual inequality in the planet. Not listen and then ignore the truth about New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, Germany, the Netherlands and Brazil. Not listen and then give free reign to the pimps, procurers, and profiteers, the very ones who made their fortunes of my body and stole my life away. This is the life I have now, writing emails and going broke, telling people I was in the sex trade, breaking it to my family. Because like the other women trying to get people to understand what prostitution really is, I care about my life and I care about other women. I'm hoping that you will listen. Simone, thank you for so much for sharing your knowledge and your truth with us. We have come here to listen to you. Thank you so much, Luba, for that beautiful introduction and to Philia and all the other survivor participants and attendees. I wouldn't be here without the support of women like you and women working globally and in my own country. So I appreciate everyone attending and watching this. Uh, indeed, I stand by every word of that. And I'm honored to be in such great company of real feminists. Australia um, had prostitution imported with invasion and colonization approximately 250 years ago. This was not something that, to my knowledge, ex uh, existed on this continent. And to give people a bit of a visual example, Australia 
is approximately the size of the United States, but our population is currently only about 25 million. So leaping forward to the 1970s, because my time is limited, uh, the global pimp interests were gaining traction as well as gentrification in certain areas of Australia. This impacted uh, on women, particularly in street prostitution in areas like St Kilda in Victoria, where prostitution is now legalised and they are put fully pushing to fully decriminalise the uh, the Johns or the paying sexual abusers, as I would call them, and the pimps and the profiteers. So, for example, people didn't want these women in their neighbourhoods around their children. They didn't want the attendant condoms and needles and so on. They go along with the prostitution system. Of course, what people really didn't want was the men, the obnoxious, entitled, violent, sexually aggressive men in their neighbourhoods and their solution to keep this out of their gentrifying neighbourhoods, uh, which were devaluing their property prices, was to try and get rid of the women. I truly believe though, that some of the women who were inadvertently implicated in creating and entrenching women in the prostitution system did so out of very good intentions because there were feminist women who cared about the women on the street and wanted to find uh, some way of destigmatizing them and getting them rights and basic support. So in the context of the late 70s and um, early 80s, feminists were using whatever framework or legal framework or policy framework that they could. So this workers' rights seemed to be the closest fit so they could put it under occupational health and safety. I don't think that they had any idea that uh, what they were doing was going to further entrench the prostitution system or how gleefully the global sex trade pimps and profiteers were um, rubbing their hands with glee at this situation. So now let's talk about those lovely men who are helping us so much by giving us money to fuck us into our liberation. Here's some quotes for, from uh, some Johns or sexual offenders, as I will call them. When you pay for sex, you get a really different feeling from what you would get in a consensual relationship. You can just relax instead of trying to share the experience with someone else. So this tells us that clearly he knows that this sex is unwanted. But further, he doesn't think that the woman that he's doing this to is someone else or a human being. Another man goes on to say that he can pull a, quote, real woman, but sometimes that's difficult, so he uses one of the others for sex. So the real women are the women who are not in prostitution and the others are women who are in prostitution. So, again, we are dehumanised. The only difference... By the way, I'm using, you know, the cleanest quotes I can find. These are not vulgar. They're re reprehensible, but these are the least vulgar. You know, John say things like they use us as their public lavatories and so on. The only difference between these guys um, and any other John is that these guys have disabilities. These are the lonely men to whom women in prostitution should be catering like Florence Nightingales. These poor lonely men who have a lot in common with every other entitled misogynist jerk who pays to buy sexual access to our bodies. Someone tell me again why it's my responsibility or the responsibility of anyone to provide women for sexual use and abuse by men like this. So, Obfuscating language. This is a wonderful trick to neutralise the reality of prostitution and move it into what Andrea Dworkin correctly called the world of ideas, the intellectualising of prostitution, removing us distinctly from the reality. 
I've spoken previously about how dissociation is a particular survival technique in prostitution to distance ourselves from what is actually happening to us in order not to repel these men away. So dissociative language can be helpful as well, which is why you will get women insisting on calling themselves sex workers. If they do, I recommend that when you're talking one on well, you respect that. But I won't be referring to it as sex work, just as I won't be referring to these men who take advantage of this situation as clients. The language like sex work or migrant sex worker in place of trafficked woman serves to invisibilize these paying sexual offenders and the wealthy local and global pimps and profiteers. To go back to Andrew Dawkins' quote and to paraphrase it, if we move into this sanitized language and we dissociate from the reality, we forget that prostitution is a man penetrating a woman either orally, vaginally, anally, one after the another, after the other, after the other. To give you an example of how someone counters this beautifully, I think, I think a woman who is an academic and scholar in Australia, and I won't name her, she's often on these panels, which I'm sure are happening globally around the world, where people operate in the world of ideas in the academy, on the decriminalization of prostitution or sex work, as they call it. They are always talking about decriminalizing the uh, sexual offenders, the buyers and the pimps, because in the majority of states and territories, but not um, unequivocally, um, women are already decriminalized to some extent. She would be sitting there, a very understated, quiet woman who doesn't lean towards hyperbole because she doesn't need to, because she quietly and clearly can argue the facts and not the person. Sitting on panels where they will talk about men who visit prostitutes, men who see sex workers. And this lovely, elegant, understated woman's response on this particular panel was, they don't visit them, they fuck them. This caused a reverberation of shock because it's very visceral when you hear language like that. You can't, you are brought down from the heady world of ideas into the fucking reality. Apparently, it is our right to be treated like this. So I think that we need to, as much as possible, describe the behaviours of these men, never obfuscated. I would like to talk more and more and more about the men, and I will always get back to them but I am not going to leave the pro-sex trade lobby groups that carry the red umbrellas, who were called the Scarlet Alliance here, out of this equation, because even though a couple of them I still count as kind of friends, I'm sick of them because they keep putting on the facade of working towards our supposed rights by proxy of the rights of this cohort of men, which studies prove over and over and over again, if sex trade survivors, if you don't believe us and what we tell you about these men, the studies actually prove that men who buy sexual access to women lack empathy, are more misogynist, are more sexually violent, and or have a, a higher propensity to criminality than the cohort of men who do not so what they're really doing is buying the rights of these men or using these men to get rights for the global sex trade pimps and profiteers on the proxy of the rights of this particular cohort of men. Friends to women, they are not. They have influenced legislation most recently in the Northern Territory in 2019 
the Northern Territory decriminalised expanding um, de the decriminalisation of these paying sexual abusers and their profiteers, and even added a clause whereby the women could be taken to court and fined if they didn't provide adequate satisfaction to the buyer. The Scarlet Alliance approved this policy without even questioning that particular clause. The Attorney General went on the Hansard report, proudly calling this member of the Scarlet Alliance her friend and naming her with her first name. The Attorney General misquoted Article 35 of CEDAW, the Convention of the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. One might forgive the general public for not knowing what that article means, but one doesn't really feel inclined to forgive the Attorney General of the Northern Territory, particularly when it has the highest rate of Indigenous women per capita in Australia. Ending demand, in ending the entitlement of these sexual abusers and their legitimization requires us to end normalization and decriminalization of these sexual offenders. It's as simple as that. And that the women in prostitution must be decriminalized immediately, immediately now. The rights by proxy of this cohort is no right for women at all. Dignity by proxy of this cohort of misogynist sexually entitled men is not dignity. The media's responsibility in this is to report it accurately. It's been noted in participating and legitimising this cohort of men and the men who profit from them. Recently, very near to me, a brothel was raided. Border Force Police deported two Chinese nationals. When I asked the journalist who was reporting on this what happened to the other women, she didn't know because she didn't think to ask. So I have no idea what happened to those women, where they went. Australia, if it is going to continue to roll out this Yahoo policy of male sexual entitlement, especially under the name of women's rights and feminism, needs to be working on a policy that will protect women that are sex trafficked both internally and um, internationally. And instead of deporting women, give them rights. Ending demand requires that Border Force actually arrests the men and the policing onus should be on the paying sexual abusers and doing their part to uphold the real rights of women. I think I'll end there. Um, and my cat's just yelled at me, so I better. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Hi, Sabrina. Hey. Thank you for much, so, so much, uh, Simon, for uh, your insights. And in, you know, you, you are you are so right about the people with right, with the red umbrellas, who intellectualize the uh, uh, women torture. And the, these people, they come to campaign and they have money. They have money that comes from multi-billion torture industry. And we don't mm -hmm. have money because we don't sell people. We only have our truth. And I believe that this truth will, uh, will come forward. And this is what we are doing now. We are creating systematic knowledge. Thank you, Luba. Thank you. Oh, Simon, uh, you are from Australia where uh, Certain states uh, have uh, decriminalization uh, legislation, and other states have uh, legalization legislation. Is there um, a, it, is the difference only in the name or the factual difference, differences between two kinds of states? What is worse and what is better for women in prostitution, decriminalization or legalization? Uh, there are differences. But decriminalization is just legalization with less regulation. For example, in Victoria, where it's 
legalised, women can still get fined for um, operating in street prostitution, for example. And in New South Wales, which is like, like New Zealand hailed as a mecca for freedom for women in prostitution, um, they have less regulation, also no licensing. You don't need a license, a license to operate or run a brothel. And uh, which is worse, I, I think they're both uh, terrible systems. That's why we need to decriminalise all of the women in prostitution who are actually selling the sexual access, whether they're in illegal, decriminalised or legal systems. The trafficking into New South Wales is particularly uh, harsh, <laughs> uh, particularly bad and into Victoria and to the point now where there was a recent case that's been, uh, there was an expose, a journalistic expose called Enslaved and that was specifically about women being enslaved by one man in a, a so-called sex cult and it was not referred to as being part of the system of prostitution in New South Wales, even though it was. He was charged with slavery, um, but the, uh, he also prostituted these women out and they refused to name um, where these women were prostituted to. And the only crime that was apparently committed was him taking money from them. There was no trafficking charge for the people who received these trafficked women into the brothel, or indeed the men who bought them for sexual access. So the media will be quiet about that. Deep investigative journalists will not go that deep. Um, and the fact that Victoria is now trying to further legalization into full decriminalization, it's happening now and it's absolutely terrifying. I, uh, thank you, Simone, for your answer. Thank you very much. Yes. Can I so please so just say in regards to um, what Yulia was talking about in trafficking into Dubai, this is a situation of women globally, particularly from the Philippines, which Myla can, would, would answer uh, particularly. But also this is why they want to call it sex work. If we can get migration visa status for work, this saves a lot of money for the pimps and the traffickers. The pimps don't have to pay the traffickers so much money if the women are being exported here on legal visas into all of these countries. It's very important to make the connection. If you legitimize this as work, then uh, the pimps don't have, us, have to pay as much money because the government in the country that decriminalizes prostitution as labor will cover the costs of something, someone coming here to do this, whether it's through mail order brides or as quote unquote sex workers. Thank you so much for listening.